When it comes to the history of Zelda, there's no shortage of ancient civilizations, forgotten kingdoms or secretive groups that have either disappeared, migrated elsewhere or fell into decay after their glory days. The only clues of their existence are found in old stories and legends, the impact they had on the history of the land, be it good or bad, or the architecture they left behind. From the powerful interlopers who got banished to another dimension, the tribe of winds who left the surface to build a new home on the cloud tops, ancient sentient robots who succumbed to severe climate change, to the still unsolved mystery of the Zonai. A tribe of so-called barbarians who once dominated the land of Hyrule in an age long ago. Witnessing the remnants of their culture as they stand empty and forgotten evokes a similar sense of mystery and excitement the first explorers must have felt when they first stumbled upon the pyramids of Giza or the lost civilization of the Inca. It makes you wonder what this place and its people were all about. What did it look like in its glory days and what caused its ultimate downfall? The land of Ikana is one such location, an ancient kingdom lost to time, a history of conflict and bloodshed, secrecy, spies and dark magic practices, and now it stands crumbling and empty. Well, if you don't count ghosts, undead corpses or the resurrected bones of its former inhabitants that is. What sets Ikana apart from other lost civilizations is that here, the past lingers on. Or perhaps more accurately, the past has been resurrected. Undead soldiers commence guard duty as if unaware that they have passed on. Packs of Gibdos and Redeads shuffle around mindlessly. Mysterious spies continue to creep around, keeping tabs on the kingdom as they once did in life. And the late king sits on his throne, awaiting the one who can rid his land of darkness. The region of Ikana is cursed. And as far as curses go, it's one of the most unsettling and powerful ones at that. But why is this? Is it all just the result of Majora's presence and influence? Did he curse the region with his wicked magic, reanimating the dead as a way to bring chaos? Or did he simply stir up something much older? Something that already existed long before the Skull Kid ever put on the mask and started causing trouble in the land of Termina. Today we will attempt to find out, and I'm happy to welcome Nintendo Black Crisis back once again to take part. Together we'll try and find out why Ikana became the land of the dead. How the ancient conflict between two factions may have been more than just your average war. And how it ties into the wickedness of Majora. So join us as we unravel the mysteries of Ikana. The history of the Ikana region is a long one, dating back to ancient times. The majority of its history is a complete mystery. All we know is that it once housed a militaristic kingdom, the Kingdom of Ikana, ruled over by a monarch, and that at some point the kingdom crumbled due to a long and bloody conflict with a rival faction, the Garo. Ikana seems to have had a similar power structure and medieval technology as the Kingdom of Hyrule. They are portrayed as proud swordsmen with a strong and disciplined army made up of guards, foot soldiers, generals, and so on. They were also skilled in the use of magic, particularly through music. This is reflected by their knowledge of the Son of Storms and the Elegy of Emptiness. The Garo, on the other hand, are more comparable to the Sheikah, stealthy and ninja-like. They deployed many spies into the kingdom to keep tabs on the royal family and high-ranking officials, gathering information about their strategies and advancements from the shadows. Perhaps their most chilling trait is that, in the case of defeat, they are instructed by Garo Law to commit suicide to avoid capture. In the entirety of the game, we only witness two different ranks within the Garo hierarchy. The regular spies who stalk the village and castle courtyard, and a Garrow master who presumably commands them. There's not a whole lot of information about the war between the two factions. All we know is that it was long, filled with bloodshed, and ultimately contributed to the death and downfall of their culture and societies. Cut to the present day, and Ikana has since turned to ruin. An abandoned ghost town hidden within the canyons. The only living souls that remain in the area nowadays are a paranormal researcher and his young daughter who study the ghostly activity, a lone gravekeeper who continues to tend to the nearby graveyard, and a thief by the name of Sakon who uses the lonely canyon as a hideout. Now, in terms of layout, there's only a few notable landmarks within Ikana as it's relatively small. 
The entrance to the region is indicated by eight decorative stone pillars. Beyond this point, there is a trail that forks into two directions, one leading into the Ikana graveyard and the other into Ikana village. Inside the village, we find the former seat of power, the imposing ancient castle of Ikana, a few abandoned houses, the music box house, which is where the researcher and his daughter are held up, and a deep well that runs underneath the village and into the castle courtyard. Additionally, at the edge of town, there's a secret shrine hidden behind a waterfall and a cave that serves as the hideout for the thief Sakon. Lastly, we have the by far biggest and most mysterious landmark, the Stone Tower. Looming over the village and castle, embedded within the mountain stands an enormous structure reaching high up into the skies. So high, in fact, that it can be seen towering in the distance from almost anywhere on the map. Inside this tower, at the very peak, lies the Stone Tower Temple. One of the most mysterious dungeons in the entire series when it comes to its purpose and history. But we'll get to that later. Many people seem to believe that Ikana has been abandoned ever since the fall of the Ancient Kingdom. But there are a few things that contradict this notion. First is a quote from Sakon who says, You know, lately, frightening ghosts have been appearing in swarms in Ikana village across the river. It seems they're the ghosts of Ikana's royal family or something. There's no one living there anymore, so I moved nearby. There's also a paragraph in Hyrule Encyclopedia that states, To the east of Clock Town is a canyon where the Ikana Kingdom once flourished. After the Stone Tower Gate was opened, the region was overrun by the dead, and the people of Ikana Village fled. When Link reaches the canyon, the only people who live there are a girl named Pamela and her father, a paranormal researcher. This seems to suggest that there were actually people living normal lives inside the canyon village up until recent events, when Skull Kid showed up in Termina and started causing problems. This explains why Dampe is still tending to the graveyard, even though the canyon is mostly devoid of life. The graveyard was clearly constructed by the Ancient Kingdom and served as a burial ground for the most decorated soldiers and other people of importance. It's also where they kept some of their most valued treasures, and the graveyard was of such importance that it remained under constant guard. Perhaps the people who lived in Ikana in the present day wanted to show their respects to this ancient burial site, and thus someone was appointed to take care of it at all times. Dampe explains that his father took care of the graveyard before he did, and his old man seems to have known quite a lot about some of the ancient history of Ikana especially the history of the graveyard itself. After Skull Kid, under the influence of Majora's Mask, started messing with the province, the dead started to rise in mass, and the village and surrounding area became a place no longer safe for the living. Thus, most of its inhabitants fled. However, Dompe, despite his fears, may have felt a sworn duty to stay and tend to this historic place, like his father before him. But the big question that everyone has when it comes to Ikana is, why are the dead plaguing the area in the first place? I mean, ghosts and the undead are nothing new to the series, but this is by far one of the most extreme places we've ever seen. The closest contender being the underground catacombs of Kakariko Village from Ocarina of Time. And similar to Kakariko, it likely has a strong connection to its dark history. As the spirit of the Poe Collector states, Ikana is stained with a history of darkness, drenched in blood. But there has to be more to it than that. After all, the dead didn't start becoming active again until recently. In order to find out, we first have to take a closer look at the bloody conflict between Ikana and the Garo. As stated before, not a whole lot is known about the war that once raged in Ikana. We know that there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of fighting, spying, secrecy and so on. But we have no idea why the Garo and the kingdom were at odds with each other. It's clear that the kingdom dominated the province as most of the structures found here are by their making. But interestingly enough, their adversary, the Garo, are almost a complete mystery. There's only one line in the game devoted to their origin, stating that they came from an enemy nation and that they were sent to investigate Ikana. But we 
never actually see this supposed enemy nation the Garrow are said to originate from. No trace of a Garrow homeworld or anything like it. Now, some speculate that the Garrow were held up inside Stone Tower. And there is one indication that this is true, as inside Stone Tower Temple is where we find the Garrow Master, the one who was supposedly in command. Thing is, Stone Tower, as far as we know, only has one way in and out, through the front entrance, which is also known as the Stone Tower Gate. While it could definitely be that the Garrow had seized control of Stone Tower during the war, I'm very much doubtful that this was their homeland. Nobody knows who constructed Stone Tower or the temple that lies within, nor do we know its purpose. But it almost certainly wasn't the Garrow or the Kingdom of Ikana who built it. As mentioned before, the Garrow are said to originate from an enemy nation outside the borders of Ikana and perhaps even outside the borders of Termina as a whole. Seeing as Stone Tower is part of the Ikana province, it's highly unlikely that they were the ones who built it. The Kingdom of Ikana does have some very impressive stonework to their name, but the notion that they were the ones who constructed it also has some stuff working against it. First off, the decorations and architecture inside Stone Tower Temple doesn't match at all with that of Ikana Castle. Ikana and Stone Tower both have a very distinct style, which isn't found in one or the other. The crest of Ikana, which many of its high-ranking officials wear, is also nowhere to be found inside the tower. You'd think that if they constructed such an impressive feat of engineering and architecture, they'd at least want to let the world know that they were the ones responsible for it. They seem like very prideful people. Second is the fact that the late king himself tells Link that Stone Tower is an impenetrable stronghold, and that hundreds of his soldiers wouldn't even be able to topple it, indicating that they did try to reach the temple at some point, but failed. Whenever he mentions the tower or temple, there's nothing that indicates that they were responsible for its construction. In fact, he seems to fear it and speaks ill of the place. Whoever did build the tower is anyone's guess, but it was likely long before the Kingdom of Ikana was even founded. We'll do a little bit of speculating at the very end, but for now, the question of who isn't all that important. What is important is that which is found inside Stone Tower, or more specifically, inside the temple that resides there. Something that, if true, could be the key to finding out the cause behind behind the war between the Garo and Ikana. There's one thing that makes Stone Tower Temple stand out from all the other dungeons in the game. And no, it's not the fact that the entire dungeon can be flipped upside down. Well, not entirely anyway. It's what happens after the dungeon is flipped that makes it interesting. In all prior dungeons, when Link gains access to the boss chamber, he will fight the boss inside of a confined room. These rooms are also unmistakably still within the dungeon itself. He either simply walks through a door or drops down a hole into a chamber below. The architecture and environment of these rooms are are also consistent with the rest of the structure, except in Stone Tower Temple. Here, Link falls into some sort of strange portal, only to emerge inside of a vast desert land that serves as the battle arena to fight Twin Mold. This, of course, begs the question what is this place? How did we get from a tower high up in the sky, upside down no less, to a desert in the middle of nowhere on ground level? At first, I thought this place might be something similar to the rooms the giants reside in, you know, after beating one of the dungeons. But there's too many obvious differences between the two. The giant rooms are surreal, hazy, almost all white. In fact, it kind of reminds me of the spirit realm where the hero Shade lingers in Twilight Princess. The Twin Mold Battle Arena doesn't look like a spirit realm at all. It looks like any other desert inside the normal world. It has a cloudy blue sky, first of all. There's buildings and ruins off in the distance, and a vast horizon of sand dunes stretching out quite far, quite the contrast to the white cloud barrier surrounding the giant rooms. So, could it be that the land we're looking at right here is in fact the Garrow homeworld? There's definitely buildings present that look like they may have housed people at some point, and the architecture of these seems to be new and unique. Aesthetically, the Garo themselves also look like they could have originated from a desert-like environment. In fact, they kind of remind me of the Jawas from Star Wars. <laughs> Even their weaponry has a lot in common with that of the Gerudo. A popular theory about Stone Tower and its adjacent temple is that they were built for the purpose of mocking or challenging the gods. This is based on the idea that Stone Tower was derived from the Tower of Babel, a mythical tower from the Hebrew Bible that was built in an attempt to reach the heavens. However, God did not take kindly to this effort and prevented the tower from being finished. However, this inspiration has never been confirmed by any of the developers of the game. It is, and still remains, a fan theory based on the similarities between the two. 
So what if the purpose of Stone Tower wasn't to insult the gods, but rather an attempt to create a portal between two dimensions? I mean, it looks like a portal, and the fact that we go from a tower in the sky to a seemingly disconnected desert world definitely suggests that it acts like one too. Whoever built Stone Tower far, far in the past may have done so to create a rift between two worlds. Whether it's because they wanted to find a way out of Termina or seek dominion over another dimension, I have no idea. But after their disappearance, the portal they created continue to exist in this location. The Garo nor the Kingdom of Ikana likely had anything to do with the creation of this portal. But the unfortunate byproduct of this rift could have been that it brought the two nations on each other's doorstep. The Garo may have discovered the portal inside their homeland by accident, used it to enter Termina and straight into the territory of a warlike nation who clearly didn't take too kindly to their visit, and likely viewed them as an invading force. One more clue that this is what could have happened is the Garo Master inside the Stone Tower Temple. When Link enters the room where the fight takes place, the Master appears from a hole in the ceiling. And this hole just so happens to be the very same one the portal is located in when the temple is flipped upside down. An interesting coincidence for sure. the creation of a rift and the subsequent conflict that arose from it is true, that means that the war between Ikana and Gero wasn't your average war between two bordering nations, but in fact, an interdimensional one. Two worlds that were brought together because of an effort made a long time ago by a mysterious, unknown group of people. But what other world are we talking about here? We know the Zelda series is rife with other dimensions, parallel worlds, and different realms. In fact, the rooms mentioned earlier where the giants reside are called Giant's Realm in the game's code. It goes without saying that we may never know for sure, unless Nintendo themselves decide to chime in. It could be a completely new, previously unseen world altogether. In that case, the Garo may have originated from a place unknown, which would explain why they are unique to Majora's Mask alone and not found in any other game. One of only a few Zelda enemies to do so. But what if it isn't a new world? What if it's a world we've already been to before? One we are all too familiar with. We are, of course, talking about Hyrule. This may sound like a shot in the dark, but there's actually some substance to this idea. The first and most obvious fact is that there is already one portal that we know of that connects Hyrule and Termina. The one that Link, the Skull Kid, and possibly the Happy Mask Salesman use to enter Termina. It connects the Lost Woods to a basement underneath the Clock Tower inside Clock Town. Not to mention that both portals share a similar trait of flipping things upside down. If there's anything we know about Termina, it's that it's a world that lies parallel to Hyrule. Perhaps the only way to access one world from the other is to literally go upside down from where you started. In the Lost Woods portal, this is achieved by going deep, deep underground. But perhaps the ancient people who built the stone tower found a different way to achieve the same goal. Instead of going deep down, they went high up into the skies. At the time of the stone tower's construction, the portal inside Clock Town may not have even existed yet. Heck, Clock Town itself probably didn't exist at this time. And even if the portal was already there, it could be that it wasn't discovered yet, considering it's hidden underground. But there's more that indicates a possible connection to Stone Tower and Hyrule. It's well known that the Triforce doesn't play a role in Majora's Mask because it's a land with its own deities and beliefs. The developers even went as far as to remove any Triforce imagery from assets and models that were reused from Ocarina of Time for the sake of consistency. However, there are a few instances where the Triforce imagery still persists, and all of them are connected to Ikana. They can be found on the ancient pillars leading to Ikana, as well as on the blocks Link uses to bridge the gap towards the entrance to the Stone Tower Temple. What's even crazier is that these Triforce decorations are at the bottom of the blocks, and don't become noticeable until the tower is upside down. Unfortunately, these Triforce depictions were removed for the 3DS version. But they didn't get rid of all the Triforce imagery here either, as there are some gold bars found in Sakon's hideout and the treasure chest minigame that have the symbol of the Triforce on them. 
strangely enough, this isn't because they reused the assets from Ocarina of Time 3D and forgot to remove the symbol. There are gold bars found in that game as well, but these are blank. So this asset is actually unique. Whether that means this gold originated from Hyrule and was brought to Termina at some point, we will leave up to you to decide. However, the same thing applies to the Ikana Triforce imagery from the original Majora's Mask. In any other instance, such as the Triforce symbol showing up on the armor of the Clocktown Guards, or something like that, we could easily chalk it up as a simple oversight. Majora reused a lot of assets from Ocarina, so a mistake like that would be completely understandable. Thing is, the blocks and pillars in Ikana are not reused assets. They are unique to Majora, and specifically made for this game. How is it that they remembered to remove all references to the Triforce from Ocarina's textures, only to design a brand new texture featuring the Triforce by accident? And not just any Triforce symbolism, but one that is mixed into the art style of ancient Ikana and Ikana alone. Obviously, for the sake of this theory, there is clear bias here. But I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that their removal of the 3DS version may have been a mistake. We have to remember that this remake was done by Grezzo, a third-party developer. The textures of Majora were not upscaled, but completely redone from the ground up. It could be that whoever remade the textures for the Ikana assets removed the Triforce references in favor for their own design without realizing that they erased an essential clue that was put there on purpose by the original artists. The final clue that shows a possible connection between Hyrule and Stone Tower is found in the ancient backstory of the Four Giants and Skull Kid. It tells of their friendship and the betrayal and neglect the imp felt when the four deities left for the corners of the earth. In an act of rage and sadness, Skull Kid started causing problems for the people of Termina, who used the song and prayer to ask the giants to step in. When they did, they threatened to tear the Skull Kid apart, which frightened the imp so much that he departed the world and returned to the heavens. Now, in Hyrule Encyclopedia, it states that it can be theorized that the giants of the four worlds exist, which they do, that the imp is Skull Kid, which it is, and that the heavens are Hyrule. And while this is just a book, when it comes to what we know about Skull Kid, this does seem to add up. After all, we actually meet this particular Skull Kid inside the Lost Woods during the events of Ocarina of Time, which is well before the events in Termina play out. This means that Skull Kid already went to Termina a very long time ago, then ended up in Hyrule at some point, only to travel back to Termina again after the events of Ocarina. This could mean that Heavens, in this context, isn't referring to the Heavenly Realm, or the Afterlife, but instead the connection between Termina and Hyrule, which was and still is found inside Stone Tower, close to the Heavens. Something similar is mentioned after defeating the Garrow Master inside Stone Tower. As a parting gift, he reveals to Link how he can flip the tower upside down, stating that, if you shoot that which releases the sacred golden light into the blood-stained red emblem outside the temple, it shall rearrange things, in which the earth is born into the heavens, and the moon is born on the earth." The whole idea of a two separate, yet connected worlds is also hinted at on some of the decorations inside the Stone Tower Temple itself. A depiction of two suns, a red one and a yellow one. Now, notice how on the clocks used in Termina, the sun is always depicted as red. This could mean that the red sun depicted inside the temple represents the sun or world of Termina, while the other represents that of the other world. In regards to the Garo, one might ask the question, if the Garo originated from Hyrule, then why did we never see them in Ocarina of Time, or any other game taking place in Hyrule for that matter? Well, we have to remember that the borders we see in maps like the ones from Ocarina of Time don't always represent the borders of the kingdom as a whole. It only displays the explorable space. If anything, Twilight Princess demonstrated that the desert is a whole lot bigger than the area we were allowed to visit in Ocarina of Time. Who knows how far the desert stretches on beyond the Desert Colossus? It's fairly easy to believe that somewhere deep inside the desert, other tribes have existed, and maybe still do, uncontacted and undisturbed. 
And of course, by the time they would have found their way into Termina, all the Garo were essentially wiped out in the war, erasing them from both worlds altogether. If this other world indeed exists, it is, of course, up for debate if this is indeed Hyrule. It's the only option that has actual evidence to support it, but it could just as well be a completely different world altogether. Nevertheless, the idea that more than one portal exists within the world also fits perfectly with that which Termina is supposed to represent. Onuma himself has confirmed that the name Termina is derived from the word terminal. And no, not terminal as in terminally ill or link dying, but as in an airport terminal, for example. A place where people come and go. A world between worlds. Whether all portals lead to Hyrule, or if there's access to other realms as well, is anyone's guess. But it's at least in line with that which this world is supposed to be. So, that takes care of the possible purpose of Stone Tower, and how it ignited a conflict between two different dimensions. But it fails to explain one thing. Why did the dead rise within Ikana? The exact reason why the dead linger in Ikana is never outright explained by the game itself. One of the royal composers, Sharp, does mention that he dreamt of reviving the royal family, and that he was tricked by the masked one, but he also makes it clear that this was a personal curse. After bringing him back to his senses with the Song of Storms, nothing changes in Ikana except that the river starts flowing again. The dead still roam the land unchecked. He also mentions that the roots of the curse lie within Stone Tower. This is confirmed by the king Igos Duakana, who says that it all happened after somebody thrust open the doors of that Stone Tower. That somebody is speculated to have been Skull Kid, or rather Majora's Mask. And I do agree that this is the most likely scenario. I, however, do not believe that Majora is responsible for the curse itself. Whatever caused the land of Ikana to become so cursed likely existed long before Skull Kid ever set foot in the region. In fact, the curse doesn't really need to be attributed to one single individual. The war and bloodshed itself would already suffice for something like this to happen. We've seen it happen before. Remember the Shadow Temple, or rather Kakariko Village as a whole? A place where unspeakable cruelties, hatred and bloodshed took place for many years during the Hyrulean Civil War? Even the description of Ikana and the Shadow Temple have quite a lot in common. Here lies Hyrule's bloody history of greed and hatred. Ikana Kingdom stained with a history of darkness drenched in blood. It also fits well with a lot of Japanese folklore. The idea that extreme emotions such as rage, hatred and sadness can linger, rendering a location, object or even a person cursed or haunted. The curse is so powerful and deeply rooted that even the song of healing doesn't do the job. Playing the song before Sharp does yield a response. He says that it eases his heart, but also says that to one of the dead and darkness like himself, a song like that no longer holds meaning. So whatever is keeping the spirits of Ikana up and about is so powerful that they are beyond healing. So then, what's keeping them here? From what we can gather, during or after the war between Ikana and the Garo, someone took the initiative to seal the doors leading to the Stone Tower, possibly severing the connection between the two nations. This action may have put the past to rest, at least for the time being, and Ikana became a safe place to live again. As long as that door remained closed, the dead would be at ease. So when the king mentions someone opening the doors to Stone Tower, that might be all there is to it. Reopening the gates to Stone Tower, the origin point of the war, may have have reignited the emotions of conflict, and thus the dead rose back up, repeating and reliving the past as if the war never ended. One indication of this is what happens after beating Twin Mold and clearing Stone Tower Temple. In any other region, clearing its temple causes the land to return back to normal. The poisoned waters of the swamp become clear again, spring finally arrives in the mountains, and the ocean of Great Bay is slowly returning back to normal as well. But in Ikana, nothing changes when beating Twin Mold and freeing the giant. The dead can continue to roam the land regardless. And to take it even further, not even Majora's defeat brings peace to the living dead, as we can still see the ghost of the king and his henchmen during the credit sequence. If the roots of the curse indeed doesn't lie with Majora or Twin Mold, then what the king said about how it all started when the door to Stone Tower was opened explains everything. After all, the entrance to the tower still remains open even after clearing its dungeon. Unless someone wises up and seals that door, the dead may continue to linger for all eternity. So in that sense, Majora didn't have to do all that much, really. The foundation for the curse was probably already there. All it 
needed was a little nudge. Of course, it could be that the curse that rests on Ikana cannot be attributed to just one thing, but an amalgamation of many. The presence of Majora, the years of bloodshed, messing around with dark magic and wicked songs, and the doors to Stone Tower being breached. Either way, I hope that those trapped inside these ancient battlegrounds will be able to find peace someday. The idea that Stone Tower once acted as a gateway between Termina and possibly Hyrule opens up so many more possibilities when it comes to Zelda lore. Take for example the ancient tribe who created Majora's Mask and then completely vanished later on. Some have suggested that this mystery tribe is somehow connected to the Interlopers, later known as the Twilight, due to some of the resemblance between the Fused Shadow and Majora's Mask. Well, if it's true that Stone Tower was built in ancient times, that could mean that this occurred during Hyrule's ancient past as well. This opens up the possibility that the ancient tribe of Majora made their way from Termina into Hyrule, and later became known as the Dark Interlopers. After all, it never specifically says that they were Hylians by descent. All it says is that among those living in the light, a group emerged who excelled at powerful magic which fits perfectly with the tribe of Majora, a powerful tribe who created a weapon so fierce that even they themselves came to fear it. This is all just speculation, of course, and perhaps the rabbit hole doesn't go that deep, but it is fun to think about regardless. Even with all that said, we still haven't even scratched the surface yet when it comes to all there is to know about Ikana. There's an entire web of people who have a connection to Ikana in some way, shape, or form. We have the Secret Shrine, which is filled with unexpected Majora imagery, and we haven't even touched on some of the magic that was used, like the Son of Storms or the Elegy of Emptiness. Two songs with strong magic power attached to them. In fact, I myself have wanted to cover this topic for a while, so chances are you'll see a video all about Ikana and its close connections to the dead on my channel in the coming weeks. And of course, Monster Maze will be joining me on that topic. So if the video does get released, there will be a link in the description down below, or you can keep an eye on my channel, Nintendo Black Crisis, or follow me on Twitter, at Nintendo Black C. And that concludes the video. I hope I was able to pitch some new ideas about a game released uh, almost 22 years ago. Please give it up for Nintendo Black Crisis for once again enriching one of my videos with his presence, as well as saving me from having to record a 10-page voiceover all by myself. A big thanks as always goes to my mods on Discord and my live streams, and to my gracious Patreons and channel members. If you will, give a warm welcome to a brand new, very generous supporter on Patreon, Jordan Concha, as well as a new channel member, Daniel Reddy. Thank you both so much, it means a lot. And that is all for now. This is Dawn signing off and have a good one. <laughs>